You are listening to the Husker Performance Podcast, presented by Midwest Dairy and your local farm families. Here is your host, Jessica Cootie. Welcome back into our Husker Performance Podcast presented by Midwest Dairy. Your local farm families want to help you reset yourself with dairy. And this season, we will discuss a variety of topics to help you do just this. And today, we're going to be focusing on sports psychology. So very excited to welcome in Mariah Bullock, athletic psychologist and a part of Nebraska's sports psychology team. And we've talked a lot about the mental health part of it here on our platforms and, and have, of course, done the mental health features. But I thought it'd be cool to talk a little bit about the performance part of the mental health. So thank you for joining us and spending some time with us. You're so welcome. Thank you. So let's just start. Okay, I know you were an elite soccer player, won a national title at Stanford and played professionally. But how did you get into what what kind of entered your mind of, hey, I might want to do sports psychology? Yeah, so I would say I've always kind of been the type of player person who really loves getting to know people, why they do what they do and how they think. And psychology is a profession that lets you do that. And I didn't know that. But going into undergrad, uh, I ended up majoring in psychology psychology just because I enjoyed the classes the most. Um, and then my very last quarter, I took an intro to counseling class, loved it, thought, hey, after I'm done with soccer, I think this is something that I could really get into. And so um, at the time, there weren't a ton of sports psychology positions. Right. The people in the field who were my mentors said, hey, Mariah, just be a kind of general psychologist. It'll give you flexibility. And so looked into that, started working, doing clinical psychology. I got my PhD in clinical psychology, started working with kids, um, quickly learned I didn't want to be working with kids, transitioned into the college counseling space, which was a little bit closer, and then finally got connected with um, my then supervisor, Dr. Tom Golightly, who's the sports psychologist at BYU. We created a practicum, and then it was just like, you know when you have that experience where it just feels right and it clicks, like mm-hmm. maybe you had that with your profession too? Um, it was that moment for me, and then I just have been hitting the ground running since. When you were an athlete, did you, because again, it's still pretty new and I feel like, and it's taken off in the last few years, but when you were an athlete, was that something that you realized it was an important part of it? Or was that something that maybe you realized later? Yeah, it took me a while, probably not until I started doing what I'm doing, where I really understood how useful it could have been. So when I was at Stanford at the time, that was 2009 to 2013, we didn't have sports psychology services. And if you wanted mental health services, you went to the general college counseling center. Right. Um, I was one of those student athletes that maybe didn't necessarily need the mental health counseling, but that sport performance, mental toughness side would have been really helpful to me to elevate. And I thought, oh, I'm fine. I don't need any additional help. But now knowing what I know, I'm like, gosh, I could have been even that five to 10% better as a student athlete that could have really elevated my game. It's awesome. So I guess for Husker fans that may be interested, just tell us a little bit about your soccer career, how you got into soccer and, mm-hmm. and how that led you to Stanford and all of that. For sure. Yeah. So my dad was born in Brazil. And if you know Brazilian culture, they love soccer. Uh-huh. Um, and so my dad got me into soccer really young when I was six. Um, my family was kind of the belief of play a bunch of sports, be a well-rounded athlete. And I, I love playing all sports. And so um in high school played soccer softball volleyball um got competitive into soccer probably around age 10 or 12 which is actually pretty late now which is weird um played club got recruited by different colleges decided to go to stanford um at the time they were kind of breaking into the elite eight final four space And then in the four years that I was there, I was around some really awesome players who are now on the national team, national teams of different nations, Um, went to the final four, all four years that I was there, won my junior year. Um, And then my senior year was the start of the National Women's Soccer League, which is our US domestic professional league for women. And so got drafted into there, went to Boston for a season and then Seattle for two seasons. Absolutely love the experience, so it's been great. How'd you get to Nebraska then after you got done playing uh, soccer and all of that? Right, so while I was at BYU with my supervisor, Mm 
Um, we presented in a national sports psychology conference, and we actually ended up presenting with Dr. Haskell, who's the director here at sports psychology. And so that's where we met, and we got to present together, we got to interact. And if you've met Dr. Haskell, she's really engaging and warm. Um, and so I ended up just really liking her, and she started recruiting me a little bit at that point of, hey, you know what, would love to have you. We have a great program going on. At the time, I kind of brushed it off because I was like, oh, I, I really don't know much about Nebraska. I'm from California. I've spent most of my time on the coasts. Um, and I was just like, I just don't really know what that's about. But I was really impressed with her as a clinician and as a leader, and I was really impressed with what she had to present. And she said, you know what, Mariah, just come on campus and see what it's about. And so I did. And I think maybe you had the same experience. You come here and you're like, wow, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what this university has, the community that surrounds it, the resources that this university provides to its student athletes, and then specifically our sports psychology department, which I believe is one of the best in the nation um, and is offering some really cool, innovative practices. And so I knew that coming here, I would be working with some great people, be surrounded by people who accept and welcome sports psychology, and that I'd be able to grow and develop as a professional. Yeah, and, and we're hearing that a lot more and more from student athletes, how it plays a role and it plays a factor, and, and especially parents. Hey, how mm -hmm. are you looking out for my, my kids' mental health part mm -hmm. of it? So where does, I guess, Nebraska stack up compared to other? And I know it's a growing field, but mm -hmm. right now, where does Nebraska stack up compared to other places across the country? Yeah, so it's not like sports where there's a ranking system, mm -hmm. <laughs> but if I were to say as objectively as possible, I think that we're really elite. I think we're in that top tier in terms of our provider to student athlete ratio, in terms of the amount of touches that we have within the athletics department, in terms of the diversity of our staff, I would say that we're top yeah, because not everybody has multiple people. They might have mm -hmm. one and then maybe a GA, right? But you guys mm -hmm. have, I guess, break down the staff for us and how that, how you guys work with the different sports and student athletes. Yep, so we have three doctoral level psychologists. We have a neuropsychologist and a neuropsychologist is someone who's gonna work specifically um, with the brain. So things like concussions, um, She'll do some assessments like ADHD, learning disorder assessments, personality assessments. And then we have a master's level clinician. And then we're also in a cool expansion phase where we're going to be adding a caseworker. And that's gonna be someone who kind of helps us to triage our services and allows us to use the specific skills that we have in that sport performance domain so that we're not just working with those who are maybe struggling with a mental illness, but we can really be focusing on the performance enhancement, the mental toughness piece of sports psychology. And you work with football and soccer, softball, rifle. And we're kind of going to be shuffling that around, but essentially we have a point person for most of our teams and we're the liaison to that team. We'll either work with them uh, individually those student athletes as the primary point person we like to share um, student athletes based off of just specialty areas and preferences and then we'll also be doing more team or greater athletic department outreach type of services right. so team services yeah that's cool so you know back in may in mental health awareness month we did a series of features talking about different mental health uh, you know, with Omar Manning, Kenzie Knuckles, and then um, Maddie Holland, who was at track and field. But I kind of wanted you to talk about, and this is where Garrett Nelson comes in, the performance part of it, which you, you've touched on a little bit, but how that's kind of different and why that's become important. Because Garrett really credits you and, and the work he's done with you to him becoming and, and developing into the player that he has because he needed to focus on that mental part of it. So mm -hmm. what goes into that? when you have somebody that comes in and, and that's what they want to focus on with you. Right, so in our department, we're looking at mental wellness as a spectrum. And so on one end of the spectrum, we have more of that mental illness space. And so those will be more clinical diagnoses like depression, anxiety, substance use, 
trauma, eating disorders, things like that. And then kind of in the middle of the spectrum, we have more just adjustment type of concerns. So that might be sleep, communication with your family, with um, coaches, teammates. Um, it might be organization type skills that you need. And then on that other end of the spectrum, we have people who are overall healthy, well, mentally well, but just either have a block in their mental performance that's keeping them from reaching their potential, or they just want to be that extra whatever percent better. And so when we're working on that, we have this framework where our first step is that we want to build self-awareness. And so the first thing is you need to know, you need to know what are the situations when I'm performing at my best, what are the situations where I have maybe that mental block and I'm not reaching my potential. And then we're working towards can myself as a psychologist help them build the skills to get past that to unlock their peak performance so that they can perform at their best consistently over time, right? And so skills like that might be being able to manage your composure. So in these intense pressure situations, can I be calm? Can I regulate my energy up and down to meet the demands of the moment? Um, we're talking about can I control my attention? Can I focus on the pieces of the game that are most relevant for me to perform well and not get distracted by the anxious thoughts, by the fans, by the media, by the mistake that I just made? And then the last bit is can I control the thoughts that are going on in my mind so that I can either just be focused on the task or I can have thoughts that are going to be helpful for me performing. And so once they develop those skills and we're creating a plan, whether that's preventative of, okay, we know in these situations, it's really important for us to hone down on that mental game. So what is our routine leading up to that that's gonna put us in the best place to perform? Or a plan of when things do go wrong, how are we gonna respond? Not only technically, tactically, but mentally, what is my process to not get stuck in the past in those mistakes and being overly self-critical and being perfectionistic and then lastly is just practice we have to do it over and over and over again we like to think of sport performance and mental health training similar to a physical injury and developing a physical skill and so on the one hand, we need to recover from physical injuries at different levels. And then also when we're learning a new skill, it takes tons and tons of repetitions for you to hone in on that skill. So you're not gonna be able to just meet with us once, hop into a game, start doing positive self-talk and everything's better. It's something that you need to devote time and energy and effort to, to make it more automatic and more fluid. Fascinating. Uh, you, you mentioned something there that I wanted to hit on too about you know being a perfectionist. And then I had mm -hmm. someone else talk to me about, there's another student I laid about the comparison game, right? Mm -hmm. and, and trying to be somebody and step into a role and, and with social media and all of that and the pressures of all of that. How big is that too, when you're talking to student athletes now in age when social media and NIL and all this kind of stuff is going on, the importance of not trying to be somebody you're not or putting too much pressure and mm -hmm. all of that, if that makes sense. Totally. So I'll start with the comparison piece. Comparison is so huge. Comparison is something that all of our brains do. Our brain wants certainty. And so when there's ambiguity of where do I stand and how am I doing, we're going to look to our environment to see, okay, well, that's what this person is doing. How do I stack up? against that. And sometimes that can be motivating. Sometimes it can be, okay, I, I really aspire to this person, and so how can I maybe mimic some of their behaviors to elevate my game? But sometimes it can be detrimental, right? And in those times, again, I go back to that attentional control of where is your focus? Is your focus on the other person and what they're doing, or is the focus on yourself and how you can become your best self? And when your focus is maybe more internal than external in this situation, that's probably going to lead to quicker development and better performance than if you're just looking at this person, this person, this right. person. And so somewhere where I see that a lot is in, so in social media, particularly when it comes to body image. I see that all of the time of this person looks this way and I must need to look that way in order to be a peak performer. And um, a lot of times that's not helpful. And so sometimes when we're working with student athletes that 
in particular are looking into social media, doing that comparison or those expectations of what media or fans might be expecting of them or saying about them, we'll talk with them a little bit about how can we manage our consumption of social media in a way that's healthy for us mm -hmm. um, and limiting it in a way that is not letting in all of that noise. Right. Oh, cool. When you start working with a student athlete and they go about, you know, getting involved with you guys, how does that work? How do they, is it just open door? Do you meet with them? How do they know that the services are there mm -hmm. and what they can come and approach you guys about, I guess? Yes. So I would say another reason that I wanted to come here to UNL is that Dr. Haskell has done an amazing job and the other staff that's come before me of making ourselves visible. Um, and I would say that the rest of the athletics department has been very welcoming and open to us. And so when we have, when I step into somewhere that already has that um, expectation of we're just another member of the staff, mm -hmm. we're similar to any other performance or support staff member like academics, like athletic medicine, like performance nutrition, whatever, then it's not weird. Mm -hmm. Right. And so also when we have other staff that are referring, referring is so, so important to what we do. If you have a trusted person that you see every day, whether that's a teammate, a coach, another staff member who's saying, oh, hey, go talk to Mariah. Like she helped when Garrett Nelson's like, hey, sports psychology was really helpful. People are going to trust you and then they're going to come and reach out to us. And so it's a combination of amazing referrals. It's a combination of all of the work done to make us visible. So whether that is um summer bridge making an appearance so that they see our face they know who we are whether that's in recruiting and we can get in front of the prospective student athletes to say this is a part of what we have here at unl or in the times when we have time in our schedule to go out to practice or to a game so that they can get to know us and i think particularly with sports psychology there's still a little bit of that idea of if i go and see you I'm going to be lying down on a sofa and you're going to be taking notes. <laughs> like, that's not what we do, <laughs> well, at least not here. Um, and so letting them know that we're normal people, mm -hmm. that we have feelings and reactions and we feel things in the same way that they do. And we also like joke around and watch the same TV shows as them. And so making us human beings um, and making it just more normal of seeing us, that's, I think, what allows people to feel more comfortable to come and see us. So, and then you, I know you guys also work in team in groups with the team too. And, and I saw you guys working with the football group in groups this summer. What was that about? And, and how does that work when you're working with in groups within the team? Yep. That was really awesome. So that came about kind of as a combination of Dr. Haskell and I's observation of the football team in conjunction with consultations and conversations we'd had with some of the coaches and then what we always love is when the student athletes come to us and take the initiative of like, hey, we want this. So we had a couple of the football team leaders come up to us, excuse me, and said, you know what? We've noticed that when we get to the end of the game, something's not clicking and we're not pulling through. And, you know, we're attacking this on the field and in the film room but we think there's something missing. Is there anything sport performance wise that we can be doing to be better? And so Dr. Haskell and I and Dr. Woods created um, like a three part series essentially that again, helped them to identify, okay, that awareness piece, our first session, that awareness piece of when those moments are coming up when we are either have the lead by a couple or we're down by a couple and it's the end of the game what's going on in your brain and in your body and is it oh shoot i don't want the ball or like oh shoot here we go again or i don't want to mess up or is it i'm going to attack this let's get after it and so we started with again that that energy management of when we're in those moments, who are the players on the field who need kind of like a kick in the butt of like, let's go? And who are the players who need a like, hey, we're all right, calm down, right? Because I think sometimes in sport, it can just be like, go, 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 do more, work harder. And knowing, okay, do I know within my position group, within my team, who are the players that need me to, again, like kind of get them going and who are the players who either need their space or need to just relax. 
Because so, no, not everybody's the same. Exactly. Yeah. But you think that it's the same. Or sometimes maybe as a coach, you think like, oh, well, this is what the team needs. And oftentimes it's an individualized process. Mm -hmm. But again, we don't have the awareness. And so that was that first piece. Um, secondly, again, we're thinking about attention control. So it's when I make a mistake, we, we, sent, we like to integrate activities. And so we had them doing this little attention grid of I need you to find numbers one through a hundred and they're scattered around and they have to go like this while their partner and the rest of us are distracting them and yelling stuff in their ear and stuff that like either you're hearing from your opponent or you're hearing in your own mind in a game and can you block out those distractors and do the task that I need to do and then that last piece was more of that thought management of when I notice my brain wandering into places that are not helpful for my performance can i switch again from that like slow process of i'm thinking i'm analyzing i'm planning to that more quick i'm just going to be in the moment i'm going to be present and i'm going to act i'm going to do i'm going to react does that make sense oh yeah absolutely and how important is that too because you you have your one-on-one -on -one sessions mm -hmm. and it seemed like everybody was so receptive to the work you guys were doing in those groups so for teammates to be able to see okay He's different than me. He's wired mm -hmm. differently than me. Yes. And so just kind of open the opening the eyes right. to that. Right. I love group work. I think that if you and I are sitting in a room, there's pros and cons to what I can provide to you as an expert. But when you're sitting next to a peer and they say, hey, me too, or they're saying, actually, I experienced it this way and it's just mind blowing, right? Uh -huh. Because it's not stuff that you talk about openly. So just to know like, hey, this is what my teammate needs. I think all of our student athletes want to be good teammates, yeah. right? But we don't openly say, hey, you know what? In this situation, what I need is someone to just be like, let's go, bro, next play. We're not asking each other for that. And so when we can have that and we can, we can build that collaboration, then it's not just you who's working on that performance enhancement, being mentally tough. It's like, okay, I'm taking care of myself, but I also know that I have this community of guys or gals, teammates, who when I'm struggling, they can pick me up and they know what I need and they can support me too. We've heard a lot about just, you know, the leadership of this football team, and I feel like that speaks to that, too. Just whatever we can do to help bring this team together. Have you guys seen that, too, just the, the leaders emerging from this group? Absolutely. I think that's what's been most impressive to me, whether it's in their leadership council, whether that's in practice, whether that is in the work that we're doing. They're very proactive, and they want to know more, and they want to understand, and they want to know okay, whatever we were doing was working in some ways and not working in other ways. So like, what do we need to change? And they're very open to whatever it's gonna take to be better. When I asked Garrett about you, he said, oh, she's a dog. <laughs> and, you know, again, just the, the importance that you've been to him as a student athlete, but that you, you balance between not putting up with stuff but, and being, you know, tough. But mm -hmm. then also I know you, you really are, have a soft side too. So how do you balance that with different athletes? I'm sure there's different needs. Right. Like we all have different needs totally. for different student athletes. Totally. So me personally, I think part of it is a little bit intuitive and part of it is just overtly me asking. So I'll meet with someone in a first session. And for me, the first part is, hey, you know, I'm, I'm interested in what you're coming here for, but first, can I like just get to know you? And can you get to know a little bit about me? And have you been involved in any type of psychological services before? And then we'll kind of get it, then I get a feel of their personality and then we get into, okay, well, what are you here for? And so there are times where I'm like, oh, this person may need a little bit more of a gentle touch. And then there's other players who are just like, you know what, just give it to me straight. And so, like I said, part of it is, can I get a feel? And maybe I'm testing out a little bit. If I, if I push here, how are they responding? Or if I'm a little bit more compassionate here, how are they responding? And then sometimes I'm just like, hey, you know what? In our work together, I wanna make sure that I'm giving you what you need. When we're doing this type of work together, when we're thinking about, we'll say performance enhancement, do you need me to kind of push you, hold you accountable, challenge your thinking? Or do you need me to kind of allow you space to come to that conclusion on your own, to do your own process work, and to feel really supported? 
So, and, and one thing about Garrett, and this is something that I, I think continues to evolve, and, and sometimes we'll get text messages about it, but that just opening up the, you know, getting away from the stigma of, oh, you don't always need mental health, and, and that just becoming a bigger part of the game and, and understanding that that can improve your performance. And Garrett said, hey, I was one of those people that mm -hmm. didn't think I, you know, was going to benefit from any of that. And so just that opening of minds for people to realize that, hey, it's, it's bigger than just, hey, this person might have depression or, or you know, the mental health part of it mm -hmm. or the mental illness part of it. How important is that to continue to, to push that narrative that, hey, everybody could benefit from this and it's not, it doesn't put a label on you because you go seek help in right. this area. Right, so, so important. I think that the conversation nationally has been evolving over time and that it is getting to a place of more acceptance and understanding. And I still understand the people who are like, I don't get this or feeling like, people who are coming to see us are soft. At the end of the day, I think everyone can relate to being in a pressure situation and feeling uncomfortable, mm -hmm. struggling, feeling like you don't have the tools to handle it, but you're tough. These student athletes are tough, so you can probably get away with it. You can white knuckle your way through performance in any domain, whether it's sport or your job or your social life. But if there's someone who is a professional who has the skills and tools to help you do that better, do that hard thing better, why not, right? right? And I think that sometimes people see our job as can we help student athletes get out of things and it's absolutely not the case. We, again, are in the business of helping develop more mentally tough student athletes. And so instead of a, a common response in anxiety provoking situations or pressure situations is I'm gonna avoid it. I don't wanna do that thing. We're not pulling them away. We're saying, can I help you do that thing? And can I help you do that thing better? Can I reduce the level of discomfort and pain that you feel? And can I help you feel more confident to go and attack it? And so when you switch, I guess, your mindset of uh, sports psychology is a way to get out of something to sports psychology is a way to get into something mm -hmm. and to be tough and to do something at the highest level that you can and to attack challenges in like the grittiest way that you can then I think it makes a little bit more sense about how we can be useful and be a huge performance tool. Absolutely. How rewarding is it for you when you see a student athlete that it clicks for them on the field yeah. or the court or wherever it might be. And they are immediately grateful to the work mm -hmm. that you've done. It's gotta be just so rewarding. It's amazing. You know, our job is a little thankless in that there's still that confidentiality piece right. or that stigma. And so student athletes might get better and no one knows why. It's nice to get a call out, but like really that's not what we do it mm -hmm. for. When you see a student athlete, whether it's for mental health concerns or sport performance, and they're unsure, they're struggling, they're 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 either eager to take what we what we're suggesting, that's amazing, but even if they're hesitant and they're like, you know what, I'm gonna try it, and then something shifts, it's my favorite part of the job, probably. Yeah. It's so, so amazing. Um, not just for myself, but for them. That's why a lot of us get into this field is we just want to help people to be better. So I love it. And we're going to hear from Garrett coming up. So just what's been your perspective of working with him and, and how he's been able to evolve since you started working with yeah. him? Garrett's a dog. <laughs> um, Garrett's amazing. I think if you know him or you've seen him play or you've seen mm -hmm. interviews of him, he's so, so great to work with. Um, him specifically, he's a motivator. He has a ton of energy. He's the hype guy. And um, we ended up seeing each other because Coach Dawson referred him over and was like, you know what? This guy, Garrett, he's really good, but I feel like there's just something getting in the way um, from him like really unleashing. So Garrett, one of those eager student athletes, I just wanna be better, right? Comes in, let me see what this is about. Um, because he is one of those student athletes that has all of that energy and enthusiasm, um, he's one of those student athletes similar to other ones where we have to be very, very deliberate about that energy management. If you're operating at a 10 out of 10, all day, every day, that's draining, right? Yeah. So then you have to play a football game on top of that. Where's your energy coming from, right? So we were talking about when are the times in the day and leading up to the game and within the game where you need to be high on that energy level, where you're 
energy, your like the juice needs to be high. And when are the times when you need to be a little bit more calm, composed mm -hmm. in order for you to perform at your best? Mm. So that was a part of it. Also with Garrett, um, like I said, he's and this is most of our student athletes, they just want to be the best, right? The best that they can be, the best in the Big Ten, whatever that goal is. And so when we have players who are very high achieving that want to be the best, it can sometimes lead into a little bit of perfectionism. It can sometimes lead into overthinking. So when you're on the field and you're like, I don't want to mess up and I want to be great, sometimes what that can lead to is you're taking in too much information. So if you're scanning the field, everything looks important because you don't want to miss anything. And so can you just focus on those one or two most important focal points? Can you calm yourself down? And then can we switch from, we think of attention sometimes as a floodlight and sometimes like a flashlight. What are the times when I need to have a very broad awareness and what are the times when I need to have a very narrow one? And then can I trust my training can i overcome the fear of making a mistake and just react you've put in so much time and so much effort into reps and practice and in film you know what you need to do right so can you just react allow your body to react to what you see and most of the time when you've done that amount of preparation it's going to result in a a better outcome than if you're like, oh gosh, I don't want to make a mistake and right. you're being yeah. hesitant or you're overthinking what you have to do. Wow, so cool. Okay, so I was just watching golf over the weekend and okay. it was brought up that whatever golfer was, like, I should have written it down, has done a lot of work with their sports psychologist to be ready for this moment. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of go golfers that listen in. Mm -hmm. you, got a, <laughs> you got a mental health tip, a mental performance tip you can give us off the top of your head for golfing? You know, if I'm being completely honest, um, I don't know a ton about golf, but can, is there, are there the concepts that apply to it? Absolutely. So when I'm thinking about golf, I might actually be thinking about, so if I'm thinking about performance anxiety, which is usually what it boils down to, when our body responds to any form of anxiety goes into that fight or flight response, our heart is racing, maybe you're getting sweaty, your muscles get really tight. And so if I'm thinking about golf, I'm thinking about, and particularly for me, I get super tight in my shoulders. Mm -hmm. So if I'm, you know, <laughs> if I'm swinging the golf club, which only happens at Top Golf, um, if I'm getting super tight in muscles that I'm not supposed to be tight in, it's gonna screw up my swing. Right. Right. So can I, in pressure moments, make sure that I'm relaxed, composed, regulating my body so that I'm using the right muscles and able to, in, in, so that I'm able to have that fluid swing that I've practiced over and over and over again? Love that. I'm absolutely going to use that. Okay, if um, you know someone might be listening in and, and might need help one way or another with certain things, um, you never know, where can we point people to reach out for help? Yep. So if you are a student athlete, then come on over. We're on the second floor of Hawks. Um, or you can contact us on Teamworks or talk to one of your staff to get a hold of us. If you are a student here at UNL, there's CAPS. Um, which is the counseling and psychological services on campus that you can contact. I don't have their number, but you can look them up online. If you are just in the community, then there are lots of community mental health resources and private practices. And I would say that the best way to find those again, you could do an internet search, which works, or um, I would suggest going through your health care if you have health care because then your insurance can let you know which right. providers are covered. And so that's the approach that I would go through. And then there are also um, national helplines if it's more of a crisis situation or you just need someone to talk to. And so that's another route that you can take. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us. It was awesome. Fascinating conversation. Appreciate it. And yep. thanks for all the work that you guys are doing. Appreciate mm -hmm. um, so much you guys being open and, and letting us uh, get the message out there. Yeah, you're welcome. Just super grateful to be a part of this community and to be working with these elite student athletes and helping create change and to get to work with you and all the work you're doing. So it's been a joy. Late night studying, intense practice, cramming for that big test. 
Take a moment to reset yourself with dairy. Dairy foods like milk and yogurt allow you to stay in the game with immunity boosting nutrients like vitamin A, vitamin D, zinc, and protein to keep you fueled without the crash. Trusted by athletes and supported by science. Last season, when I sat down with Garrett Nelson, he had brought up his work with Mariah and how important that's been to his development as a player. So wanted to get his perspective as well on the Nebraska Sports Psychology Department and the impact that it's made on him. Yeah, um, it, it was kind of weird, uh, you know, in high school when you're the stud and everybody loves you and, you know, everybody tells you that you're right. Um, it's kind of easy to get lost with that. And um, it, the flip side of that is that you have a lot of confidence in what you're doing. And when you get to college and you're not, you know, the study anymore and you have to work for things and coaches tell you you're wrong all the time, um, you kind of start to lose that uh, mental edge of, as an athlete. Um, and that kind of – it's good because it drives you and you want to get back to that mental space as, as a player. Um, but – how you do that is important. The process you do that is important. So um, that sports psychology department has helped me a ton of understanding, um, you know, the elite level aspects of how to get back to that mental space, you know, um, kind of diagnosing you as a person, personality wise, what pushes your buttons, what doesn't, um, how you react in different situations. Um, just kind of d diving into that and personal profile of you. And then, uh, you know, kind of making a plan of how, to implement into games what you do during practice you know whether it be breathing or having a mental reset or where your focus is or you know things like that those tools that you can utilize during the game to kind of get you back in that mindset and mind space of that you know you could destroy it you're a world beater and nobody can block you so um utilizing them has been a big leap forward just mentally in my game what made you open to that? Because not everybody is open to the mental part of it. They just think, oh, go out there and see ball, get ball. But yeah. for you, what, what made you open to understanding that part of it? Because I was that guy, and I realized that didn't really work <laughs> uh, at this level. Um, so kind of maturing as a person and being honest with myself um, and, and telling, you know, it's hard to, as, you know, everybody thinks we're really big, tough football players. So when you open up about, yeah, no, I can't really – you know, I don't really have the confidence when I go out there. I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, they kind of break that down, and um, you kind of dive in deeper into that sentence, you know, and why don't you do this, or, you know, what what do you focus on, or how do you feel when you do that, and just kind of being, it's hard, um, but being open and honest about that and uh, them helping you through that and you putting it into practice during practice um, of how to get back to that focused mental state and uh, play the best of your ability. What does it say about Nebraska that it is such an emphasis here and there's a team of people and they help out everybody and, and there's different things. It's, you know, whether it's depression, anxiety, all these different things, but then also the mental performance part of it. How, what does that say about Nebraska that they want to provide that for student athletes here? Yeah, we've always been innovators at the university. Um, that's the one thing they emphasize here um, and is uh, there's a history of us always being on the cutting edge of everything. And, uh, having realizing the importance of that and having that team of people to help athletes you know across all sports is is huge and it says a lot about this university and how much they care about the performance of their athletes last thing just um you know for fans that listen in that you know some people might be apprehensive to that the mental part of things and and how you address that your mental health and the performance part of it what would be your message to somebody that is listening in that might not know a lot about it but just how important it is to the overall well-being of a student athlete the biggest thing for me i didn't realize how common it was i thought like when when coach dawson came up to me and he was like hey have you ever seen a therapist and i was like um <laughs> uh what do you mean by that and he and then he started to dive into it and he was like pretty much every professional golfer has one nfl teams used hundred a lot of them all the players pretty much going i think he was at the giants for a little bit and pretty much almost every player went and saw one um you know you see on the field or on TV how big and tough and strong and incredible things these athletes do. You don't really realize how much of that is mental um, and just having the confidence to go and do that. So when, when you started telling me how common it was and all these players that are incredible in the next level, um, I kind of realized that I was kind of being immature and selfish and not reaching my potential as a player. So um, went and talked to them and changed a lot of things. You work with Mariah, right? Mm -hmm. And how cool is she? And how what that what is that relationship like? Oh, she's a dog, dude. She she, <laughs> doesn't, she doesn't put up with anything. So um, I can be honest with her about it. she's she's you know Olympic soccer player. She's 
been on the world team several times and, you know, on top of being a mother and, but, um, yeah, she's phenomenal. She helps me a ton. She doesn't let me BS anything. So she does, she does, she does well. She knows to push my buttons and how to get me in the right space. It's awesome. All right, that's going to wrap up this episode of the Husker Performance Podcast presented by Midwest Dairy. If you missed our first episode, it's out right now wherever you listen to your podcast with Zach Duvall and Dave Ellis. And also make sure, make sure you subscribe and like wherever you listen. We've got some cool perspectives and episodes that are headed your way featuring other areas of the Nebraska Athletics Department. So make sure to keep it right here on our Husker Performance Podcast presented presented by Midwest Dairy and your local farm families. Thanks as always for listening. I'm Jessica Cootie with the Huskers Radio Network.